fact, we're very pleased to be collaborating again with the Center for European Reform. Um, we're really thrilled with the lineup of today's event, um, which is, of course, in no small part to the excellent rep reputation of the Center for European Reform. Um, our first event on the DMA was held back in early December with Olivier Garçon. Um, the timing of that event was fortuitous. Um, it just happened to take place two weeks before the Commission's proposal was published. So we, we received some great insights from Olivier into what we could expect. Um, since December, things have moved on somewhat. Um, we now, of course, have the Commission's proposal. So attention has turned to the European Parliament uh, and the Member States. Um, the Parliament has selected its rapporteur, uh, Andreas Schwab, um, and we're very happy, delighted that he's here with us today. He has, of course, um, considerable experience um, in the past with respect to competition issues, uh, and that experience will be very helpful um, in the context he's faced with today. The Council, um, under the Portuguese presidency, uh, has made the DMA a priority, um, and discussions among member states kicked off in January. Um, so the legislative process is fully underway, and my impression is things are going really full steam. Um, we followed with great interest the discussions in your committee, Andreas, um, and some themes seem to be emerging, um, among which are the legal base. Um, is this competition law or an internal market instrument? Um, how will the date DMA and competition policy work together? Um, whether the DMA will in fact lead to speedier outcomes. Uh, what will be the combined impact of the DMA, its provisions on um, informing the Commission of Mergers, um, and the Commission's own guidance on RT Article 22 of the Merger Regulation. Uh, and very importantly, of course, how will Articles 5 and 6 be interpreted, um, and whether improvements can be made to the legal drafting, um, and finally, um, whether the structural remedies and unbundling um, called for in the draft DMA could go further. Um, and in parallel, cases continue to be brought before the national competition authorities. Um, they have plenty to do. Um, and some of these cases are relevant, at least in general, to the development of the DMA. Um, so we hope that Isabel and Andreas um, Andreas Munt in this context um, will um, be able to say uh, a few words about how they see the DMA fitting into their work and what role their authorities and perhaps more broadly member states um, will be able to play in the new world we will find after the um, implementation of the DMA. I'll now hand it over um, to Camino to guide our discussion today. Thank you very much everybody for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and welcome everybody uh, from the Center for European Reform too. Those were a lot of questions, so I'm going to try um, to give a very brief introduction um, that go beyond a little bit um, the nitty gritty of the lawyer questions that we will um, hear about um, afterwards, hopefully. Um, so as Thomas said, my name is Camino Mortera Martinez. I'm a senior research fellow at the CER. And I'm based in Brussels, and I shall be uh, chairing this event uh, today. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Schwab, who is here with us right now, has a meeting in about 15 minutes, and I think it's about something related to the matter at hand. So we have to be very brief in this introduction. Um, I will just um, uh, basically um, explain who is um, here with us today to talk about the DMA. And I think none of them need any introduction for the audience, but I think it's still polite to at least say their names. So we have with, we have with us um, Andrea Schwab, Dr. Schwab, is a member of the European Parliament and the rapporteur of the Digital Markets Act. Uh, we've got uh, Pedro Rodriguez Duarte, the chair of the Working Party on Competition at the Council of the European Union. Isabel de Silva, the president of the Competition Authority in France, and Andreas Munt, the president of the Federal Cartel Office in Germany. 
Now we'll be talking DMA, gatekeepers, industrial policy, and lots of other things with them in a minute. But first, two very boring housekeeping items from me. The events will have two parts. This first part, where I will ask questions to the panelists as sort of introductory remarks. And this part will be uh, recorded and broadcast later on, and it will be on the records. After that, we'll figuratively turn off the cameras and we'll start the Q&A with the audience. And that part will be strictly of the records. So now that I've said all this boring stuff, let's start uh, with you, Dr. Schwab, so that you can um, get on with your very busy morning. Now, you're a member of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee in the European Parliament. Uh, so you have the never easy job of leading this file, the DMA, through the negotiating proceedings. I hear, and I think Thomas mentioned that as well, that the division of labor between the different parliamentary committees has not been really easy on this one. And since most of us, are, most of us sorry, are lawyers and not really acquainted with the procedures of the nitty gritty of the procedures in the European Parliament, I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit more about how the process works and how you are, where you are at at the moment. And there I ask, do you think it will be smooth sailing? Thank you very much, uh, Camino. Um, thank you so much uh, to the Center for European Reform for the invitation. Um, it's for sure my pleasure uh, to um, explain you a bit the procedural, but also the content related questions that are ahead of us. And, um, and I will be happy to stay with you until 10.30. Now, as all my intervention will be um, 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 recorded, I will be very polite. Um, and those who want to understand what I want to say have to give a second thought to what I'm saying. So, uh, well, thank you so much. Um, you have uh, entitled that meeting Curbing Big Tech. We don't want to be curbing big tech. And all those lawyers um, that are used to competition policy and that are liking their job and that hope that their clients will stay with them, they have to understand that this is something big. It's about fundamental rights of EU citizens that are not only freedom of speech, but also freedom of business development. It's about an open, transparent, and fair single market. For sure, it's difficult what fairness means to define, but obviously we have been seeing that not only the market behavior of some tech giants was not at all fair, but also that the reactions of the European Commission and the competition authorities came far too late, were far too little, and have therefore not been able to reinstall fairness. So this is about fairness. And uh, you should not start with any uh, specific point of view on this, but you should start as a, as a human being. Starting your career in Europe as a lawyer, as an engineer, as a software developer. And we, the European politicians, want to give you 100% of chances to develop your idea. We don't want you to be limited by specific imposed uh, rules of uh, uh, companies. The rules in the European Union are set only by the lawmaker. Um, and the lawmaker is bound by the treaties. That means the measures that we do have to be proportionate. They have to be based on the rule of law. And they have to be realizing these main goals of the fundamental uh, uh, charter of rights of the European citizens. And here comes an important step. Um, in Germany, in the, after the Second World War, we have been discovering, and this idea went over to the European Union, that if there are two dominant companies in a country or in a society, there is a risk that also the democratic decision-making process can be misled. We have seen it in the 20s in Germany, and we have been saying to business in general, that will never happen again. And therefore, our laws to fight antitrust are very tough, not only in Germany, but also in Europe. And I was very happy, and I know because uh, Isabel da Silva is with, with us today, that the French, uh, her pre predecessor, Bruno de la Serre has reminded me that story when I was discussing with him and Olivier Garçon uh, some years ago at the Conseil d'État. This was a marvelous experience for me that the head of the French Competition Authority has reminded in my presence to the auditorium why um, big dominant companies have to be uh, controlled. And this has to be done in a proportionate manner. It has to be done in a fair manner. But big tech has to understand that that is something which goes much beyond 
uh, curbing big tech much beyond uh, regulating gatekeepers. But to fix it here in a proportionate way, we have been saying, okay, there are the fundamental rights of every citizens, also of the shareholders of the, the big tech companies, um, but there are also all the other fundamental rights. And therefore we have to find a law which is not too uh, bureaucratic, which has not too much red tape, but which focuses very clearly on the problem. And the problem, dear guests, dear colleagues, is not uh, 20,000 European companies. The problem is between five and maybe seven companies. Maybe in two years time, we will maybe have only four, maybe 10, but it's not about regulating the market. It's about having a very clear cut tool to fix problems that in competition policy have not been able to fix, be fixed ex post in the speed that was needed and that we wanna fix ex ante. The problem is that all these companies have a unique business model um, and the techniques they are using are different. The only uh, common denominator is that they are controlling bottlenecks that are there because of lock-in effects in digital. That is in a certain way, the key point that we are striving to fix. And um, therefore it's uh, based on article 114. That means that it's going beyond 101 and 102 of competition policy, but for sure, the main reflection behind is that the fairness that is there based in 101, 102 comes into the whole market in an ex ante uh, definition based on 114. So there are quantitative and qualitative criteria for gatekeepers. The commission has a lot of freedom to define them and it can only be in a single market focusing the law like that can only be one authority defining gatekeepers. And the quantitative criteria are a bit too large at the moment. They give the impression that there could be also 30 companies covered, but that is not the case. It's only a few and therefore we have to raise the threshold uh, accordingly. But that doesn't mean that the European Commission has not the power also to put into the scope emerging gatekeepers or companies that are uh, gatekeepers in sectorial markets for all very obvious reasons. The, uh, the points in um, Article 5 and 6 that have already been mentioned are a bit, um, are still to be improved, let's say it like that, because they are based on experiences that we had and they are all linked to one competition case. That's very nice to make the public understanding what fairness means in the European Union. Article five and six give a very clear picture. But unfortunately for some companies, some of these rules are not applicable or can be maybe applicable only in the future, but then in the, uh, a different uh, context. Therefore, obviously we have to give the, a lot of flexibility um, to the regulator, a bit like the German uh, article, uh, paragraph 19a GVB is doing. Um, and we want to also to learn from all countries in the European Union that have already been starting to discuss about that, what we can do to combine these general principles. Um, the French uh, law has a lot of examples of such blacklists and gray lists with a general clause that has to be uh, used in a fair and transparent and uh, non-discriminatory manner, but it has to fix and to hit where the problem is. So we have the carrot, which is article 7.2. Uh, this dialogue that is a bit too weak because if you want to speak to a company of that size you should not come uh, and ring the bell and saying can i please come in no you should say listen we are coming here you prepare a coffee and you put on the table these documents if not uh, we will close that part of your business immediately so there has to be a much more authoritative role for the european commission and for all authorities that are uh, linked to that when checking um, uh, some unfair practices but as i said it has to be lawful it has to be proportionate it has to be non-discriminatory and transparent, but it has to be much more um, regulator-like and not like, can we please get some information? That, that would be the wrong message. Then we have the stick, uh, the systemic non-compliance in Article 16. And for sure, the, the European Commission, the, the authority has to have all options on the table. And proportionality is important, but proportionality has always to be seen in the context that all citizens of the European Union have been impacted by the behavior of these bottleneck controlling gatekeepers. So proportionality cannot mean, ah, there is a bit of this and that. No, we have to see that this is an overwhelming problem for the whole European society in democratic uh, um, um, integration of citizens, in business development of citizens, in the overall market economy. And therefore it can also be proportionate to be very tough. 
But as I said to you, we hope that we will never use these tools because I have a very strong belief that these companies have good compliance systems. And if this law is in place, they will understand themselves that they want to be compliant and they will abide by the law immediately. Um, and the shareholder value uh, will also help them to respect that. Uh, and therefore the investors will know that if they invest correctly, they will have a better return on investment as, as if they didn't. These market investigation procedures that I have been not yet mentioning linked to Article 16 um, are a bit too uh, lengthy because that we have already seen in competition policy so far. Therefore, this has to be speeded up. Um, and um, the essential facility doctrine um, uh, there um, can um, maybe play a more important role. Uh, we have to assess the core platforms. We have to assess services as core platforms in a certain way um, that are important and essential to the community in a way that it's not easily duplicated or easily to be duplicated, sorry, and that it has secondly reached a stage where it's not economically advantageous because it requires a huge amount of investment and money to be a competitor. And thirdly, uh, that it makes it very hard, uh, even impossible to compete with such uh, platforms. Therefore, we want to use all the reflections that have been playing a role in competition policy, but we want to, to use them in a way which is based on Article 114, non-discriminatory, transparent, based on the rule of law, but proportionate in a manner that takes into consideration the whole problem that not only the European, company, uh, European companies and societies have, but also at worldwide level. And therefore, um, we have to make that in a way that it can also be enforced well. And that's in a certain sense, the moment where uh, the authorities to enforce that law come in. Here, we have to find the right mix of national law being easily applicable by national authorities, and at the same time, a European-wide uh, application that makes clear that we have common rules uh, in uh, 27 member states and we share the aims of that directive. And, and finally, there are people that are saying we should raise the sanctions. Honestly, I don't think that these companies are scared with sanctions. Uh, what we have to do is that the procedure is tough, much tougher as at the moment proposed, uh, that there are decisions made without suspensive effects that have an immediate uh, um, uh, um, impact. Um, and that cannot be discussed for years in court before coming into place. Uh, and if we do that, I think the, the, the sanctions are not the key uh, question. So I hope that um, with this short outline, dear Camino, um, I have given a, a correct and, a, a, and a, a realistic um, state of impression of the discussion in the European Parliament. For sure, our aim is to finalize this law by the end of the year. That will be a bit ambitious. In any event, we would like to uh, finalize it under French presidency at the beginning of next year. Um, and that must be our aim. Um, and therefore we could also vote in the plenary only in January. Um, I think there will be some discussions with colleagues because uh, the question is, is the key driving force of this law contestability of markets or are there other elements? And that will have to be seen because unfortunately we have lost a bit of time when um, assessing the responsibility on that file. But as you know, I've been making my report on digital taxation, which is also linked to digital markets and gatekeepers, and that has to be finalized before. And therefore, for me, it's now an, a perfect opportunity to restart the work on this. And I'm looking forward to stay in touch with a lot of you with good ideas, what we can improve with the text. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. I think this was a very comprehensive um, summary also for us. Um, for, for those of us who are not competition lawyers ourselves and thinking of internal markets, um, legal basis and things like that, it's a very interesting angle uh, from which to look at these issues. Um, now, I am aware of the fact that we've got um, three more minutes with you. And my instinct would be to ask you a very provo provocative question that probably you can't answer uh, in this online or on the record part of the seminar, which is, um, you talk about five or six companies, and I wonder whether is it your opinion that any of those those are five or six companies is going to be European? That would be a question that I had. You, now you can answer it or not, uh, but I'm going to bring in um, one of our of our colleagues uh, who wanted to ask you a question, and that's Catherine Schallenberg. Um, it's a partner at the Paris office of Clifford Chance. Um, so, Catherine, if you are there. You, you, hi, hi, I think you can talk now. Yes, hi, hi, Kavino, thank you. Uh, Dr. Schwab, thank you very much for this very interesting and, as Tamina said, comprehensive overview. 
I did prepare a question which was to ask you about your priorities or one or two priorities, but you, I think you answered that question in your, in your uh, speech. So um, I was wondering, I would be really interested if you could say a little bit more about the procedure that you have in mind to actually enforce the various um, obligations. You said you wanted, you said sanctions weren't necessarily going to be very effective or increasing the, the amount of fines. And you talked about decisions with immediate effects and not long court procedures. How do you, can you say a little bit more of how you envisage that to work? Well, Thanks. I don't see any more anyone, so I think I should come in oh. here, but... We see you. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, no, thank you very much uh, for the question. Maybe I should start with Camino. Um, I mean, for sure, obviously, there, is a, there are people trying to put a bit pepper on, on this by saying uh, this is anti-American. It's not. The problem, in fact, is American because the American economy has given us uh, the impact to understand what the fight really is about. Um, there are plenty of American companies uh, talking to me, uh, explaining to me how badly they are treated under other American companies. That's not our key problem, but the companies that are at the European uh, market uh, merit altogether a fair treatment. Uh, the gatekeepers, the so-called gatekeepers at the moment, and all the others. And we are looking for a fair balance. And if this law becomes a reality, our hope would be that these gatekeepers can become even more innovative again, because uh, if there is a stronger challenge by the fact that killer acquisitions are not possible anymore, these companies will become innovative themselves again further. And we will have other competitors that based on innovations that are not absorbed by them come into the market. And like that, we may see in five years a, a big competitor from Japan we may see a, 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 a gatekeeper from Mexico, or we may see a gatekeeper from um, uh, Algeria, uh, maybe even from the European Union, we don't know. But uh, the aim is not to protect um, boring European uh, stakeholders. The aim is to allow for innovation and fair competition, because we believe that competition is the best what we can do for open, fair, and um, and democratic societies. Oligopoles and monopoles could sometimes have even cheaper prices. But in the long run, and we have seen it in the Soviet Union, they don't work and they create even democratic imbalances as we have seen in Germany. Therefore, we have to boost competition and we have to boost openness uh, in the sense uh, that it helps not only the European single market, but also the American market and by that, and we know that there is plenty of interest also at worldwide level on how this law will be applied. You know, for example, that the Japanese have applied the same rules on GDP, on, on data protection, GDPR, and on cybersecurity, NIS. I was the rapporteur myself on the NIS directive. And therefore, I have a, a good experience how people in the end want to be a rule taker if the rules are good. And therefore, we will have to aim at making them the best that we are able to do. And I hope that I can contribute a little to this. On the second question, uh, Ms. Schumacher, I think, um, um, uh, the, the, the aim of this law is um, to enforce it in the best way possible. For this, we will need a lot of um, um, people with knowledge of the market to give uh, information to the authorities. We need um, speedy processes to investigate. Um, and for that, we need authorities that are also have a very close link to national law to apply national rules to investigate. Um, and we need manpower. Um, and that can be done um, only if these authorities are working well together and maybe also if there is some sort of private uh, enforcement. And therefore, we have to find um, the best structure possible. You may know that in the telecoms market, um, we have gone for a similar a reflection some 10, 20 years ago. The market situation there was very national. Uh, the European Union cooperation was not yet at that uh, close uh, interaction level that we have today. And we have at the time created a separate authority. We have seen that the telecoms market has gone quite uh, difficult, has lived quite difficult times, with quite rigid rules that have not 
been helping competition to flourish as we would have wished it. Um, but we have also seen that competition authorities have been um, struggling with uh, imply, applying the rules in competition policy on uh, big tech. So we have to find the right balance to make sure that this is regulation, but that it's uh, soft touch regulation uh, without red tape and fast and speedy implementation. And, and on that uh, reflection path, I would like to invite you to elaborate further. Uh, and maybe if you have also to come back to me with good ideas. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. I think um, that was a very um, concise um, summary. And um, we'd like to thank you again for, um, you know, like taking the time to be with us before running to your next meeting. Um, I'm sure that all of our um, well, panelists and also attendees will um, go back home and think hard and send you some ideas. And I, I'm not sure <laughs> that they need much prompting on that. <laughs> but anyway, thanks so much for that. And um, I, I hope that we'll be um, talking to you uh, very soon. And I'm sure that we'll, know, we'll be knowing um, of you and the file um, in the coming months uh, quite a lot since we'll be following this very closely. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwab. Thank you so much, Camino. And I hope that next time we will be able to meet again in person because even if digital is useful, it cannot replace uh, human interaction uh, in direct uh, situations. And therefore, next time, hoping uh, to meet you again in person. Bye bye. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, as so I was saying, Dr. Schwab had to leave because he had a, a very urgent meeting. I think he was kind enough to give us um, 15 more minutes that he was supposed to. So I hope that he doesn't get into hot water with his assistants for that. Um, but um, let's move to our um, three um, all-star panelists again. Um, and I'm really happy to have them here. Um, Senor Rodriguez Duarte, you chair the Working Party on Competition at the Council of Ministers here in Brussels, but I also hear you are the Portuguese presidency, uh, presidency's uh, DMA whiz, so to speak. So I know that you know anything, everything about the DMA. Um, I can perhaps use the fact that you're wearing both hats here today to ask you two slightly linked, albeit different questions. So my first one is because we know that both the parliament and the council will have a say on the final shape of the DMA, I wonder whether you could shed some light on the position of the council at the moment and whether you could tell us um, if you, you know, think that this is going to be an easy file to negotiate. The second question would be, since the Portuguese presidency is coming to an end in two months, um, what is that you guys would have had wanted to achieve on this file by the time you pass the baton to Ljubljana on July the 1st? Good morning. Thank you, Camino for inviting me to join this high level panel. And uh, well, I, I would call the chair a whiz, more uh, a facilitator or a pull factor, but thank you anyway. Indeed, I have been wearing at least two hats for the last months, and I hope that they suit me, you will tell me. And as the proposal on the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, was adopted in mid-December, we knew from the beginning that the first negotiation month, which coincided with the Portuguese presidency of the council, would be like navigating through uncharted waters. What uh, actually goes uh, very well with the Portuguese presidency's logo, taking both the form of a sun enlightening as all, and a helm steering the youth's boat. We managed to work hard and uh, enthusiastically during the 14 working parties, working party meetings, 
And I am very happy to confirm that the Portuguese presidency's main goal is going to be achieved in the course of the current month, meaning a first full examination of the whole text comprising 39 articles and the corresponding report of the progress accomplished to be uh, delivered to ministers uh, at the Compact Council. Then in June, we will see if there is enough stamina among delegations to go a bit further and allowing the Slovenian colleagues to resume discussions as more mature as possible. Antonio Garrigues Walker, a famous Spanish legal practitioner, said that optimism is a moral, moral obligation and pessimism is a moral offense. Well, I'm an optimistic by nature and I do like to build consensus and to get the interest parties closer without jeopardizing coherence and consistency. So being aware that the council has been putting a lot of effort uh, on this file and being also aware that the EP mentored by a very experienced and active MEP such as Mr. Schwab is also very motivated about the upcoming interinstitutional cooperation. I wouldn't call it a difficult agreement. Uh, bien au contraire, I, I think it will be promising. So to sum up, I would very much like from an institutional, but also personal point of view, to be able to deliver to the Slovenian presidency a very good basis of negotiation framed by a constructive atmosphere, a smooth process and a strong vision on the substance. Because after all, this will be an historical piece of legislation. Thank you. That is indeed a very optimistic <laughs> and, and ambitious goal, um, given that, yeah, we have two months, but I'm sure, I'm sure that will be the case. Um, well, let's go back to, to the nitty gritty of the procedures um, and perhaps more on the Council's position um, uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, now I'd like to say uh, good morning to Madame de Silva, um, who is, uh, I haven't said good morning to. Um, Madame de Silva, you preside over one of Europe's uh, most powerful competition authorities. And as we all know, French views have shaped recently the debate in Europe over whether or not we need to use competition rules more forcefully for wider geopolitical purposes. Now, I know that this, this is a, something that is politically sensitive and perhaps we can um, you know, dive into it um, afterwards in the Q&A session. Uh, so let me ask you two very straight and direct questions. Do you think the DMA is the right answer to the problems it is trying to address? That is to avoid a deeply entrenched large technology companies to acquire even more um, power and hinder competition? That's my first question. So is it the right answer for the problem that um, we, are, we are trying to deal with here? And the second one, once the DMA or something similar to it is in place, what role do national competition authorities want? Hello everyone and uh, thank you Camino for, for that question. Sorry to have arrived a little bit late, I had a, a technical issue. Uh, it's um, to answer your first question, uh, I think that the DMA uh, could be a very useful tool uh, but we shouldn't expect the, the DMA to answer all the different problems that uh, digital platforms may create for businesses. So uh, I really think we should think at, at 
of this tool as an additional tool to other existing tools. Uh, and the main one being uh, competition law enforcement based on European competition law and national competition law. But we must also think that uh, this new set of obligation will come in addition to other existing obligations. Uh, and I would like to mention a few. Uh, consumer law, uh, we see that uh, there are many problems uh, concerning digital platforms that can be sold through uh, consumer law. But I would also like to think about privacy law. We have seen how important GDPR was in terms of addressing uh, some issues related to privacy, which is, of course, of paramount importance today. And we have also today uh, the P2B uh, regulation, platform for business, uh, which uh, in a way uh, is a little bit uh, at the beginning of the, the thinking about the DMA, because the idea uh, of the P2B regulation was to have a regulation that would be only applicable to certain actors. So GDPR, when you think of it, is applicable to all the, uh, different players, uh, be they public or, or private. And with the P2B regulation, we narrowed the scope a little bit to focus on what uh, is defined as a platform. And now with the DMA, we are uh, going one step forward in terms of having a specific set of obligation and prohibition that is applicable only to a very select few, uh, a very select uh, group of, of, uh, of uh, entities defined as gatekeeper. So it's interesting to see that we are going in a very uh, targeted direction. But uh, I think one of the, the most important issue is to really think globally of how the uh, effective system of rules uh, will apply to platforms. And that is why, uh, as uh, the, the French Competition Authority, we are very uh, focused on making sure that the DMA will work well in addition to competition law, because we mustn't forget that competition law is at the basis of uh, what aims at protecting uh, the, 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 the United market in Europe. Uh, and um, it, is, it will always remain very effective because it has a very broad scope and, and can be applicable to, to a number of situations. But the, the idea behind the DMA is, of course, to have uh, those exempted obligation and prohibition. Uh, and the, the objective is to gain uh, time to be more speedy. But also, I think uh, it's, a, it's a bit of thinking differently about the way you control platforms, because uh, in competition law, you look uh, uh, at a company to see if it has broken the law. Uh, has it been a breach of uh, Article 101 and 102? Uh, with the DMA, the, 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 the idea is a little bit different. Is You, you, uh, you will say in advance to, to a given uh, gatekeeper, those are the rules of the game. Uh, those are the things you must do in a, very, in a more detailed manner than what Article 102 could do. And also, uh, those are the specific things that you cannot do. For example, self-preferencing, we know it has been at the heart of the Google shopping case. So you find out self-preferencing uh, among uh, other things in, in the DMA. Uh, but uh, it's important to think uh, in terms of complementarity because uh, of course, this means that you, you mustn't uh, expect the DMA to solve everything. And, and that leads me to, to an important point that is, for me, I think that uh, a lot of the debate should focus on Article 5 and Article 6. Uh, uh, Dr. Schwab already mentioned that Article 5 and 6 were extremely important. And I think that now that the, 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 big, uh, the big rules of the DMA uh, ha have been accepted, I think, by most of the member states and the parliament uh, based on the proposal of the commission, we should go into greater detail uh, about Article 5 and 6 uh, to, to make sure that they are indeed proportionate. But um, I think that also what one thing, one objective that is important is that we make sure that the DMA does not weaken existing tools. Uh, so that will be, of course, something that we will look at in terms of how you coordinate with competition law and competition enforcement. So one of the issues that we have, you were asking about what role we see uh, for national competition authorities. We think that the DMA will be more effective uh, if the, the national competition authorities have a role to play, uh, because uh, the commission will have a lot on its plate. And I think that the task is so huge that we, we need all the men and women we can get uh, who can look at those issues and help the commission. 
So that is one first reason why I think that the NCAs could be, uh, should be allowed to, to enforce the DMA, but also because we have seen on those issues with platforms that, of course, they are global, they are European and, and worldwide, but you have also some issues that have more relevance in certain countries. So it's, it's important to be able to think at the same time globally, but also to, to have this local uh, enforcement and local view, even with big platforms such as Amazon, for example, we see many differences in terms of how Amazon is powerful in the market in the different countries of the EU. So uh, that is something that we must have uh, in mind. And also about uh, my worry that we should not weaken competition enforcement. There are some legal issues in terms of parallel enforcement of competition law and the DMA because they are very close. They come from the same, uh, the same womb, so to say. Uh, so we must make sure that the coordination is extremely well thought out in advance, because if there is any sort of legal loophole or, or fragility, then uh, those companies will take advantage of it and, 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 uh, and talk about them in the court. And I think that uh, to, to, be, to be sure that the DMA is well, well designed and well enforced, we must also learn from the GDPR. Uh, we have seen that uh, GDPR um, and, and the competition law could work together. For example, we've had a, a recent case about Apple iOS and, and the decision by Apple to, to strengthen privacy. And we looked at it through competition law, but also discussing with the data protection agency in France. So I really think that in the future, uh, enforcement based on those different legal rules will be a lot about coordination between different sets of laws and different regulators. So I think this is really something that is here to stay. And we must also learn from the GDPR that uh, a lot must be uh, thought and prepared in advance about the way different uh, authorities will be able to, to work together. So there are some issues about GDPR enforcement in that respect, that maybe the system that was defined in advance was a little bit too rigid. Uh, with the, the notion of uh, country of origin. So I think that is something we should take into account for the DMA to have a system that will be much more flexible because as Dr. Schwab has said, uh, the whole purpose of the DMA is to be faster and more efficient. So we must make sure in advance that the legal rules are sufficient uh, so that we, we can move forward uh, in a very speedy manner. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, maybe uh, one uh, last point about uh, the, the global efficiency of it all. Uh, this will work also if the courts uh, follow suit and uh, there is nothing uh, much uh, in the DMA about the courts, but I think that they are an important element of the debate. Uh, Dr. Schwab was mentioning the fact that uh, those uh, cases must be settled rapidly, and this is not always the case. We are still waiting for a decision on the Google Shopping case. You have the Facebook Bundeskartalat case that has been sent to the European Court of Justice. So you see that uh, it's something I think that we should tackle in addition to the DMA. And maybe one final word that we mustn't forget that at the same time, a competition enforcement is changing because we have the ECN plus directive that I think will solve many of the issues we have seen with, uh, with the digital platforms in general. For example, to mention only that, the possibility for NCAs to uh, open ex officio uh, interim measure proceedings I really think that this will be a very useful tool. And as soon as we have the, the legal instrument applicable in France, we will really be looking at that very seriously to, to, to use it when it is uh, necessary. So we'll stop there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madame de Silva. I think that was a very good overview as well of what um, NCAs can do. Uh, to make the DMA uh, work better. And that's, um, that leads me directly to our last but not least panelist, Hert Moons. Um, you, are also, um, uh, you also chair, like your French counterparts, uh, one of Europe's mightiest regulators. And I believe that you're also looking at the moment at cases uh, that may or may not overlap with European legislation uh, once and is and if adopted. So um, I have a very similar question um, than the one I had from Madame de Silva uh, to you, but it's more related to the coordination in between NCAs and the Commission. Um, what do you think, um, how do you think that national competition authorities should cooperate amongst themselves and with the Commission 
once and if the DMA is in place. And then a bit of a provocative question to finish this part, this open part of the debate, which is, do you think the DMA is going to take power away from NCAs? And if so, is that a good or a bad thing? That can, that can only be a bad thing, of course. But um, <laughs> first things first. Um, first, uh, firstly, thank you very much for having me today uh, at this important meeting. I mean, there's a debate around the world how, uh, how, to, how to deal with big tech. And, and I fully agree with Dr. Schwab. This is not just um, on, on American uh, companies. I mean, in other areas of the world, we have big tech too. Um, if you look at China, for example, and they will be striving to, to, to put a foot into Europe uh, one day more than they do today. So this is really directed towards companies uh, of a certain kind, ecosystems, uh, which has nothing to do with the, with the nationality. Um, we have had great cases as competition agencies, but of course uh, we would like to have more impact on the market. And I think that is also necessary in this diagnosis. I fully agree with uh, Andreas Schwab. Um, uh, so of course we, we, we welcome the approach that the DMA um, is taken. There are some questions with regard to the substance of the DMA. We also believe that article five and article six might be too narrow, there's too much focused on behavior that we have seen in the past, not open in, uh, enough to behavior that we might see uh, in, in the future. Personally, I also have my doubts if the addressees of the DMA, if that scope is not too broad, I think there will be 15 to 20 companies falling within that scope. So um, I'm wondering if, if this, is, this, is, uh, this is going to be changed. A major concern that we have um, is on institutional issues because the DMA does not say very much on institutional questions and it leaves that very much to the future and to delegated acts. But I think it should be clear from the start who is doing what and how to coordinate. That starts with a tricky question, who at the EU level is going to enforce the DMA? And here I can only hope for the best that this is going to be DG Comp and nobody else. And why is this so? I mean, first of all, the DMA in substance is competition law. I mean, of course you can argue we go into a regulatory direction, we take a regulatory approach. We also did that in Germany with the new um, Article 19a of our law, which has some regulatory features because we can act on markets where big tech is not dominant and we can act on markets before they are dominant. That of course has a regulatory approach. But if you look at the do's and don'ts in the, in the DMA at the obligations that can be imposed, that is purely competition law. That is all from the cases that the DG uh, Comp has done in Brussels, that uh, we have done in Bonn, that Isabel has done in Paris and other colleagues in Rome or in, in Spain, uh, in Madrid. So it is competition law. You can turn it upside down, but it remains competition law. And who's the one who should apply competition law? Of course, from my, from my perspective, uh, that is DG Comp. My second point is, how far can we go with regulation with regard to big tech? I fully agree with Andreas Schwab that every company that we could target has a different business model. They're not the same like in telecommunication, in postal service, in railway service. These are areas where you have very homogeneous business models, which are to a certain extent quite easy to regulate, very successful in the area of telecommunication, but maybe this is has been driven by the market itself to a certain extent. I don't see this big success, at least here in Germany, with regard to postal service or, or long distance trains, for example. I mean, here regulation has not been the success that we wish the DMA. Second point is, um, everyone talks about self-enforcing rules and self-regulation. 
I have my doubts that the DMA is self-enforcing to that extent because of the different business models. I mean, what happens if the agency that will be in, in, in charge of enforcing the DMA tells to one of the big companies, uh, this or that is not DMA compliant. And then this company comes to DGX and says, oh, I don't agree. I'm fully DMA compliant. What do you do then as an agency? You open up a proceeding. And since all the business models are different, you will have to assess a certain behavior in a very specific situation. And I, my prognosis is very quickly, you run into the same assessment problems that we have today when we open up proceedings under competition law. So you see, it is very difficult to talk about regulation in this context because these companies are so different, the business model is different, the conduct is so extremely different. So no matter how you shape it, it will remain competition law to a certain sense. And this is why, at least from my perspective, it makes all sense in the world to leave the enforcement with the competition agencies that have the experience to enforce uh, in this area. A second point is, and here I fully agree with what Isabel has said, the DMA is not the sole and lonely uh, tool out there. There are very many others. There's consumer protection law, there, is, there are privacy issues, uh, there is GDPR, there is first and foremost competition law. And competition law will remain applicable. Articles 101 and 102 will stay in place and they will be applied and enforced against big tech, you can be sure, by DG Comp and by national competition agencies. So at first level, you would have to find a coordination mechanism at the European level if it was not DG Comp to enforce it. Um, I think that should be avoided. I mean, that, that would, would really be bizarre if you had to coordinate among the European Directorates General who is doing what with which tool against what company and which conduct. Really difficult. But I can, I can make it worse. Um, Article 101 and Article 102 are also enforced and heavily enforced by the national competition agencies. Um, our Facebook case uh, was already mentioned. We have uh, had two very successful cases against Amazon in the past. Uh, Amazon has changed its behavior worldwide due to our case in 2019. Um, we have restructured the relationship between Amazon and the sellers that are dealing on the Amazon marketplace. Since 2019, sellers on the Amazon marketplace can claim, uh, can, can go to German courts against Amazon, which they do today. So there is heavy enforcement, not to mention the Facebook case uh, that has been sent to the European Court of Justice now. And I can make it even worse at this point, we have just new legislation in place in Germany, Article 19a, which is very similar to the DMA, directly directed uh, against big tech. We have opened our first proceeding already against Facebook. And uh, usually I don't announce proceedings, but, but you can be sure that we will make heavy use of Article 19a, which the legislator has offered to us, a new tool, uh, very much in line with the DMA. So we are going to open new proceedings uh, in the upcoming weeks, uh, no doubt about that. So how to coordinate all that? Um, DG Comp, DGX, applying DMA, Article 101, 102, national competition agencies, applying Article 101, 102, uh, applying Article 19A in Germany, Italy is thinking about creating the same, uh, the same, uh, the same provision also with regard to, to Italy. So all that is to be so 
solved easily, easily if you leave it within the sphere of competition law, because here we have an existing mechanism with a European competition network to coordinate among us that has been very successful in the past. Uh, so everything is in place in order uh, to coordinate at the European level and uh, in the direction of the national competition agencies. And I would go further. I would, I, I would, I would very much agree with, um, with, uh, with Isabel. Why not include the national competition agencies into the enforcement of the DMA? There are cases um, that have a very heavy focus on one member state. Um, if you talk about Amazon, for example, for, for Amazon, Germany is by far the most important market in Europe. And it is not a coincidence that we have had two cases against Amazon already and that we have, well, tried to enforce um, for the better in Germany. And we are very happy um, that, that Amazon has applied the new rules, not only here, but also in Europe and, and, and uh, beyond that. So you see it works and we should make use of it. I can very well imagine uh, that the European Commission remains in charge exclusively to designate a certain company to be an addressee of the DMA. I think that should be centralized. But I also believe that the European Commission will be confronted with lots of do's and don'ts and behaviors by the addressees uh, of, the, of the DMA. And I think that national competition agencies uh, can be extremely helpful in this respect and that we will be able uh, to focus uh, our force and to bundle our forces uh, and uh, to act uh, together. I think th these are thoughts that, that are not yet reflected enough in the DMA, as I said, it lacks um, a mechanism for cooperation. There is no mechanism for information exchange among the acting uh, agencies in, in Europe. Um, and at this place, again, I want to remind you, we do not have to reinvent the wheel here. It's all there. It's all in the ACN. We are used to it. The ECN is a role model worldwide, even the ASEAN, ASEAN countries take a close look at this cooperation mechanism. Uh, and we should think of it when we think about um, these cases in the framework of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the DMA, competition law, GDPR, consumer protection law. And this is a great chance of the DMA, by the way, to do that right and to steer it in the same direct in, in the in the right direction. Many thanks. Thank you very much, um, Herr Munz. I think there are so many questions, and like from a very uh, nerd institutional point of view, um, I'm puzzled by this question of who will be um, in charge of the DMA if it's not DigiComp, because you know, like when we learn EU law, we learn that only DigiComp and uh, a bunch of other agencies have like central uh, sort of uh, powers in the European Union. So that perhaps would be a question for Pedro. Pedro, do you have any idea who like, if it's not DigiComp, who could be dealing with the DMA? Well, I, I cannot speak on behalf of the commission. I'm, I'm representing the council, and uh, but yes, uh, Isabel and Andreas, uh, they are absolutely right. Uh, DMA, and I guess no one is denying that DMA is a competition tool, another competition tool. Um, the the thing, the new thing about it is probably the fact that is an exempty uh, tool and competition tools normally are uh, dealt with by competition authorities. And at the commission, there is one competition authority 
So uh, that is the the far that I, I can go because uh, I I'm not uh, uh, Mr. Mrs. Van der Leyen. I, I'm not uh, Olivier Gerson. So uh, yes, uh, you don't be surprised if if you comp would be the authority for the MA. Thanks so much. I think that now that Dr. Schwab is not here, we can all agree that the DMA is a competition tool and move forward. <laughs> well, um, I think um, that's going to make it for our open session. We've run way over time, but it's because uh, this conversation has been so interesting and, and Dr. Schwab has stayed with us uh, more than we expected him to. Um, so perhaps we can uh, have five or ten more minutes at the end of the session uh, to accommodate all the questions that I see are coming already from our audience. So now, um, as I said, the cameras are going to be switched off. Uh, again, figuratively, please do not switch off your cameras so that we can see you. And um, if you want to ask questions, uh, please raise your hands 